what's wrong with it today I used to have one too Maybe I'll come and have a look I really love Your hair I do, yeah I'm glad you like mine too See we're looking pretty cool Get ya That worked. <laughs> How are you doing? Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hear a wave if you're there. Great. Thank you for joining Distance Resistance, everybody. I'm delighted to see you, and uh, I'm extremely impressed that you made it on this uh, very, very warm, certainly warm evening in various parts of the world, I'm sure, but it's very hot in London today, and it's, uh, I know it's hot in New York as well, so um, thank you for coming, and I'm delighted, delighted to see you all. How many people, some of you, I guess, are new to this, right? Give me a wave if you haven't done it before. Although I can't see everyone's face, like, to be honest. But anyway, it's nice to see you. Thank you, Joe. Great. So look, we'll get into it. Um, thank you for waiting and listening to my, uh, I couldn't stop that song because I really like it. It reminds me of my youth in the 90s. So that's why I was playing it. So um, hello, thank you so much for joining the Distance Resistance. We're staying apart. Um, we're apart, we're sort of staying apart, although less and less, frankly, at the moment. But we can still come together, can't we, for a bit of um, fun and, and inspiration after work. Um, and the idea of this event is that it's kind of informal and, um, and, and relaxed. And that's how we really like to, really like to run it for us today. So um, first things first is hopefully you've got a drink. Uh, the way it's going to work is I will um, introduce each of our speakers and we'll, we'll chat to them. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll get into some questions uh, and a conversation with each of them before finally um, asking you guys to jump in. And we'll also be looking during the, um, during the call, we'll be looking at the chat. So you can pop questions on the chat side. And uh, sometimes towards the end, we love to get you guys on screen asking questions as well, which is really, which is really good fun and a chance to kind of get a sense of the, the whole community that are on here, right? So that really works. Um, I'd also like to thank Nick from Hyper Island, who is uh unfailingly here helping me out to uh to run our wonderful distance resistance events this is this is the ninth event we've done since the lockdown began um and it's been you know it's been intense really and i i've got to tell you i really love having so many of you from so many different places around the world come and join us it's been incredible for for all of us who've 
been part of it and for me particularly and uh, uh, you know you've been incredible inspiring and clever and funny often and uplifting and you know tonight I'm sure will be no different so anyway we're ready to go um I, I don't know if I've ever bothered to actually introduce myself to you which seems like a, a bit rude but uh my name is Leo Leo Raymond and um I have the the great pleasure and privilege of leading a team of of misfits uh called Grey Consulting a worldwide gang and um our job is we make brands more competitive inside and out, and we do it um, in three ways. We design new propositions to help companies exploit growth spaces, so new areas of opportunity. We help rethink a brand's purpose and positioning for the modern world. And, and also, the, we think about the inside part. So how do you modernize your working culture and your daily practices? Because you need to get all three of those things working in tandem to really succeed, we think. So that's the story about what we're doing. Um, Tonight's theme is how not to waste a crisis. And I'm sure you've seen in my kind of preamble for how we uh, were focusing on this event tonight, there's, there's been such a fascinating opportunity to observe this crisis, these crises play out in front of our eyes over the last couple of weeks and months. And, and I think we've all felt, one, that we are much more adaptable perhaps than we realized we were, but also that things that were impossible or seemed impossible suddenly have become possible. One of the things that I noticed very early on, I'm sure many of you did, and, and it depends on which city you're in, but in London, homeless people were suddenly taken off the streets. So they were put into hotels, which seemed impossible, but suddenly it was possible. And now I think we're having to understand what will happen next. Similarly, right-wing governments suddenly paying for school meals um, or seeing a real acceleration in diversity and inclusion worldwide based on the results of not COVID, but Black Lives Matter, though the two things are entirely related. I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, pharmaceutical and healthcare competitors collaborating, about businesses being rebooted, about us finding new meaning, all these impossibles that suddenly become possible. I mean, what, what could be a better topic for a conversation between, between us tonight? And I really want to understand with you guys, and I mean all of you on, on the call today, you know, if our assumptions about what is impossible have been wrong, what else might be wrong? And how do we make sure we're not going to waste these, these cracks that have opened up, these opportunities? How are we going to make sure we don't waste them? Um, I, there's a, something which we do at work, we really think hard about is the impact of um, um, the way you think about the world really, really determines how, how you can understand and solve it. And there's a great quote from um, a lady called Nancy Klein. You might know her. If you're into coaching, you've probably been told to read this book. Um, but the quote is, the most tenacious block to new ideas is a limiting assumption. And I, and I really like to bust those assumptions by bringing together very diverse teams of people to, to chat. And so that's really what, what tonight's about. So enough of banging on by me, um, at least for now, about myself. But let's, let's talk about our, our three amazing speakers tonight. So first up, we're going to um, introduce uh, Dr. Funke Abimbola, MBE. Are you there? I am here. Hear you, hello, yeah. hello, everyone. I'm yeah. going to try and do um, a mini, a mini write-up about you, but we'll we'll talk a bit more about that. But um, Funke has got an amazing CV, and I, you know, we could do the whole call just talking about that, which um, I'm sure we'll do some of it at least on there. But healthcare executive Funke worked her way up to the C-suite via a very, a very distinguished career in the law and and then the pharmaceutical industry in healthcare. Now she works as a board advisor. She's a commentator for the BBC. She's a diversity leader. She's spoken at um, the TEDx. I, I saw your talk actually the other day. I was looking for some quotes to use. So I was uh, very impressed by the climbing <laughs> the mountain. Outside Thank of you. her day job, as if that isn't enough, she's got a 17 year old son, I think. Um, yes. And campaigns extensively for equality and diversity and inclusion. And maybe is that why you met the Queen and why she was, um, why you got your MBE? Yes. So I didn't, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it was uh, Prince Charles that I met, um, which was amazing. He, he really did surprise me hugely. But yes, it was because of the diversity work, uh, all voluntary, and the work I do with young people as well to improve their outcomes. I love it. So maybe, maybe we'll touch a bit more on that today, and I'm yeah. sure you'll, you'll talk about that. Our second speaker tonight um, is Tom, Tom Freshwater. Are you there, Tom? I am, yeah. Good to see, see everyone. Here sound as well. So Tom, um, I'll try and do this justice, Tom. I'm not sure if I'll get it entirely right, but you can, you can correct me. But you work as, of, as head of public programs at the UK's National Trust. I should probably explain National Trust to those of you who are not um, from Britain on the call is, I guess it's the National Cultural Heritage Organization that ensures that 
properties and aspects of history and our kind of common shared heritage are preserved and made accessible to the public. Is that a fair description? But, uh, yeah, a couple of things. It's, uh, the one I work for is uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland only. Scotland is entirely separate. Um, and we are, although we're called national, we are not in no way funded by governments. We raise money independently ourselves um, yeah. to, to do that. And we are large. We've got a membership base of about five, six million people, 70,000 volunteers, 500 sites. So it is uh, the largest conservation organisation in Europe, um, I think. Uh, includes stone circles, mountains, coastline, nuclear bases, all sorts of stuff. So as well as mansions that people often associate us with. I should um, also say that there's other, I do other stuff as well. So. <laughs> that sounds still quite busy. Um, yeah. And you can tell us a bit about that. I know you've been on this very prestigious programme called the Claw Leadership Programme that's really about developing, I guess, the next generation of leaders in the arts sector. And, um, and I think partly, I guess that must reflect somehow the, some of the work you've done before, which we'll talk about in a bit. And also um, one of the things that Tom's going to talk to us, I hope, a little bit about is how the National Trust, with Tom's help, are addressing the histories of slavery and colonialism at uh, National Trust properties. So I think it's pretty, um, pretty topical. Um, yeah. Final speaker then, Ruth, and then we'll come back to you later on, Tom. Ruth mm -hmm. um, is senior lecturer. So if I get this, hopefully I get this right for you, Ruth, and help me out. I know that um, you're a senior lecturer in ethical design thinking at Schumacher College, and which I think is the leading ecological master's school. Yeah. You're the co-editor of a magazine called Red Pepper and this I just couldn't get my head around, it sounded so amazing, but I'm sure you hear it all the time. Co-founder of Bread, Print and Roses, a collective involved in anarchist baking and seditious pamphleteering, which we need to hear more about when we have our chat, because I need to understand that. And, um, and also, if you can help me out with my sourdough starter, that really isn't working. And you're currently advising um, an English member of parliament, right? Caroline Lucas of the Green Party on the opportunity for a, a sort of big reset, is that right? That's absolutely right, yeah. And working with an amazing bunch of people to do it. So I'm looking forward to kind of getting into that with you and that will end there and then we'll, we'll get through it. So thank you all for coming along. I really appreciate, we all appreciate your time tonight. And um, I think what we'll do straight away without ado is, uh, is, is Funke get on to our conversation. Are you ready to have a little chat and tell us a bit more about what you've been doing recently? Yes, I am. I certainly am. This is a wonderful evening. I love these get togethers. So I have had quite an interesting time because I planned to have six months out of my permanent full time role before COVID ex escalated. Um, so it just happened to coincide with lockdown that I started my online um, executive MBA leadership studies with, with Wharton. And as part of that, to embed my learning, I started running my consultancy. Uh, which has completely snowballed, of course, because I work in the healthcare sector for the last 10 years or so. And I've got so much exposure to not just the legal and government side, but also the patient pathways. I did a lot of work uh, around getting the drugs to patients and the uh, interactions with the NHS. You know, how do we empower the NHS mm. to be operationally more efficient? So, of course, when COVID kicked off, it's meant that I've leveraged my corporate law experience advising um, businesses uh, around recovery and different aspects of how they get through this tricky period. Um, and then most importantly though, it's the actual healthcare side. I've been advising on uh, one of the, the large uh, clinical trials that's ongoing. I can't say any more uh, about it uh, than that, uh, but it's probably the largest one uh, that you see uh, talked about. Um, I've been advising businesses around COVID recovery. There's some unique sets of challenges uh, around COVID particularly in how businesses can recover. Uh, with social distancing and all the mechanics around that you know how do you run an office is there face return so there's some really tricky issues there um and i'm also an interested party in the covid uh Bain, Bain inequalities report and that was something that evolved uh, as more and more evidence came out of uh, what we were seeing emerging evidence was there was definitely uh, an issue there. Uh, so I've been involved in that. Um, and again, I can't say too much about where we are on that. But there's a common thread. Um, this is the point that COVID-19 has actually really presented some interesting opportunities for me to add value uh, during this six month period before I go back to a permanent role later this year. Yeah, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll come back because I think it'd be quite a good segue from, from our conversation to on to Tom when we talk about you know, the, the, the BAME, the realisation around BAME. But let's start, maybe we'll start more broadly around in the, or at least in healthcare and business point of view. One of the things that when we spoke before getting ready for, for today, Funke, we were talking about how 
strange things have happened and competitors have started collaborating. I mean, what, what kind of interesting opportunities have you seen that, that have sort of been born as a response to this crisis, at least in the healthcare area? Yes. So I know pharmaceuticals very, very well. I work for the largest um, global pharmaceutical company. They're both global, global companies that I've worked for. And I spent most of the day at a, a global summit, actually looking at digital health, use of health tech and so on. And this is a summit I've, uh, I've uh, been to a couple of times, but this year felt very different. It was all about collaboration. There wasn't a sense of uh, maintaining competitor advantage or uh, almost being uh, more mindful of your competitors and how they might be launching a competitor drug. There were, you know, COVID-19 has really brought together very innovative collaborations because we're facing a major global crisis here. Mm. And that, that burning platform is something that I'm really proud to say the pharmaceutical industry has risen up to. So and well, they, they typically have been much more cutthroat and aggressive and elbows out in the past then? Or was it a nice community? What was it like? Well, I mean, all things being equal, it's like any competitive space, right? You know, if, if your driver is, is profit and in pharmaceuticals, that profit is important because it's ploughed back into the research and development. Uh, so it's important that, you know, we are profitable as pharmaceutical companies. But what is very, very different here is because this is a global pandemic uh, that we're dealing with, with all the challenges around not even knowing much about the drug initially, you know, infection rates, there's a lot that we're only finding out as more and more people recover and so on. That has presented a real opportunity for, for the sector in which I work to really collaborate in very innovative ways. Um, you know, one of the companies I used to work for is Roche and um, they are collaborating with Gilead, for example, on a number of drugs. They're, they're looking to tweak uh, existing drugs because, of course, time is very much against us. So there's no time to start innovating. It's got to be looking at existing drugs and tweaking them. So that was announced a few weeks ago. And that's a massive, massive thing because that coming together, that, that common ground has only happened because of COVID-19. It was all about collaboration today on this summit. And I found it really motivational. I felt that things are very, very different this time around. And do you, so do you think that, the, and I guess it's very hard to predict, and often when we try and we had a, a session, I'm not sure if you joined it before, about, you know, can we predict anything a few weeks ago, a few months ago in the, on the distance resistance, but quite often we sort of project our own hopes onto it. But do, do you think that that kind of spirit of collaboration happening today is something which might endure in... You know, if we're talking again in 2022, might there be some, will some of that remain or will it have gone? What do you think? I think because we've reached proof of concept. So when these collaborations happen and I've, I've led projects, uh, you know, across different drugs and, and looking at how we can leverage uh, the drugs for the benefit of patients, you need to get to proof of concept first in a sort of mini project way and then you scale up. Of course, what this has shown, and this is a consistent theme that I've seen also in the NHS with things that have very changed there. I mean, I come from a family of doctors. So although I, I read law first and then moved into healthcare, mm. every immediate family member uh, works within the NHS as, as a doctor in different specialities. You know, I've got a brother who's a GP, my sisters are in a large teaching hospital uh, in London and so, so on and so on. So there have been some revolutionary things mm. in the health, you know, in, within the NHS. Video clinics are now the norm. And they free up resource. You don't have to find parking, you know, which is a major stress for patients. Trying to find car parking yeah. um, in, in a, a hospital car park is, is really difficult. So again, you know, it's the whole healthcare piece. Obviously, pharmaceuticals is a huge part of that. But it's the whole healthcare ecosystem that's reached proof of concept with some fundamentally different ways of doing things. And it's radicalized, you know, efficiencies have come out of this. Patients can be seen quicker and, you know, the, the use of resources is more efficient now. Because of course, when you're in a crisis, you have to prioritize quite ruthlessly where you deploy your, your resources. So in your, in your, you know, when you're having conversations with people that are your peers from that world, and in a funny way, we all, you know, we all operate in our own little worlds. We have our own networks and we get a sense of how we're feeling. But what sort of, what sort of um, mood are you finding other people are having? Are they expressing the same sense of hope and are they very excited about it? Or is it, is it very, you know, is it very wide ranging responses? I mean, how typical, I guess, is your feeling of what's really going on? 
Well, let me put it this way. So I worked in law firms for 12 years on, until 10 years ago, four different law firms, all office based. Um, some of whom had flexible working policies, many didn't because it's a long period of time, but all of them now have flexible working, agile um, working policies. Now, until this happened, where for the sake of businesses actually surviving, you know, for the sake of the firms actually being able to service their clients, everyone had to work from home because there was, you know, there was no way to socially distance. And the challenge we have now is that people can't go back because lifts are an issue and you know i had one law firm say to me that if staff started arriving at 5 a.m they would still not all be in the building to comply with social distancing until about one o'clock so clearly yeah. you know it's not going to be possible for everyone to come back as normal mm. and now it works because it's been forced to work where before there were all sorts of excuses around essentially presenteeism, you know, we always feel as solicitors that the client actually wants to see us face to face or that the partner who's supervising us needs to see us physically in the office. Well, this has shown that that is not the case. And in mm. fact, some firms are doing even better because of course people aren't commuting. So, you know, some people are using the commuting time to, to do a bit more extra work and, and all the work is charged out or on an hourly rate, of course. So you, you literally, you know, you, you record your time Mm -hmm. So some firms in some areas have seen that this has actually become more profitable that people aren't commuting uh, every day. I mean so that, I think... that, that profit word is interesting, isn't it? Because um, one of the uh, one of the conversations we were having about this is that, in a way, that we've had to put patients before profit, perhaps in a way, in as the healthcare sector as a whole, in a way that perhaps hasn't been done for a, you know for a long, 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 long time, certainly in the UK. But and that seems to have helped sort of also drive this innovation process somehow it's kind of it's kind of fascinating to see this transformation occur i mean what sort of if you were trying to think about what what you feel excited about where this might go you know what might be the next two or three things well maybe that's too much what might what might we see next that would be kind of born from from now yes i see other sectors learning from this because when you're looking at operational efficiency there are standard rules that can be applied to other sectors. I mean, I use Lean Six Sigma as my basis for continuous improvement. And then I, I leverage project leadership skills on top of that. And the actual mechanics of what's being looked at, the frameworks are applicable to just about every industry, every organization, anywhere where you can recognize that there might be waste in a process and everything, let's not forget is a process. Let's not forget that everything we do is a series of steps leading to a desired outcome. And there can be a very efficient way of doing that. And there can be a really inefficient way of doing that. Everything we do, when you get up in the morning, when you decide to have your shower, do you have breakfast at home or do you take it with you to work? Or what do you, you know, there, yeah. there are all these things which actually it's all a process. And that technology, that sort of thinking can be applied to anywhere where you know everything's a process right so i see huge potential that really excites me i'm a lean six sigma a practitioner so i see everything as a process um and i see huge opportunity for driving efficiency which is what lean six sigma project leadership is about across every possible organization That's even voluntary sector you know it doesn't have to be profit driven for example does that connect then to because one of the questions we, i was keen to ask you is kind of what assumptions what limiting assumptions are being busted right now? And they may be relating to process or, or more broadly, but is that, are you seeing that sort of happening live in front of your eyes? I am. I mean, for example, with the law firms, one of the assumptions that were made before was that there was no way that IT systems could possibly work with, you know, 99% of the staff working remotely, which is what is actually happening in some firms. It's 100%, of course. Yeah, right. And actually that's, it's been fine. I mean, some firms needed a bit of extra, you know, tweaks here and there, but essentially within about a week, even the largest firms had everyone up and running, all bandwidth issues were sorted out. They were adaptable around the types of video call technologies they use, depending on the size of the team. Mm. So, you know, something like Zoom is great if you have a massive team and, you know, that might not be needed for a smaller, smaller teams so people and that's why you see so many video call technologies being used all the time i mean i i discovered blue jeans the other day which you know i i um when i have my wharton lectures online 
their their choice is blue jeans because for them that works best you know with a setup but there's so many available and that is wonderful to see that you know before now law firms in particular felt that there was no way they could sustain uh, that level of everyone working remotely and they they had to you know yeah. they had to make that happen now I, I did say at the beginning and it's a bit of a, a hard jump but we you know we said we would talk a little bit about I know you can't reveal what you've been working on in relation to BAME and the healthcare crisis or the COVID crisis, but are you, are you hopeful that that is being tackled in a way that there's a, a, a sort of a next step that's going to happen that will help make it fairer in terms of how the COVID is striking as it were? Yes. And the reason I say that was, and this is now in the public domain, of course, the first report, um, didn't have all the all the information that was provided. Lots of people were involved, and within about a week, it did have. You know, the second report did have all the information, and that came about because of pressure on all sides. The, the you know the other interested parties, um, you know, wrote letters and emails to to whoever they could influence uh, within the, the Department of Health or the local MPs. And that's what led to that. That's what led to the right, because, you know, it's, it's a burning platform again, Leo. You know, we've, there's a, a genuine burning platform here. I mean, for me personally, of course, I've got a, a personal vested interest in this because, you know, I'm constantly worrying about PPE and, you know, because, you yeah. know, for example, my sister's in a large uh, London teaching hospital. So, you know, viral load and all the things that we're now hearing a lot more about uh, was a real concern at one time. So that, that, is, that, is, that gives me hope because the report now has recommendations um, and now an action plan will come out of that because that's the next step with accountability, with you know, measurables around targets being met, what does success look like? And that came about because of a lot of interested parties putting pressure on, on various aspects of the government. And, and that hasn't actually happened before in such a short time frame for something that has such wide ranging uh, implications yeah that's interesting and I, do you think that um do you think that the the conversation was i guess the conversation today with the pharmaceutical industry are they also they must have do they have the, the bain challenge center center state or front of mind for them as well absolutely because certainly i've only ever worked for global companies so you know that they are global in outlook and, and certainly roche is is you know constantly looking at emerging markets and uh, because th those will be the markets where, you know, in the future, there will be more growth. And a lot of the emerging markets, of course, are, you know, people who are visibly, you know, minorities. So, yeah. Yeah. Th there's, you know, there's a sort of, there's a vested interest in there, of course, commercially. But that said, there's a genuine intent there this time around. I, I really, really do believe that. And I felt it uh, on this summit today, that's, without that's a doubt. Reassuring to hear. I'm going to give you one last question and then we'll come back at the end for some. And, and the one, my last question is really about, you know, if you, if you were sort of give us all one, you know, something I guess that you, we could learn about how people around you have been responding to either of the crises really, that we might be able to apply ourselves. Is there anything that kind yeah. of... I think it's just the embracing the uncertainty actually because we very quickly realized that um with the best will in the world with such a new virus and it's called the novel uh, yeah. coronavirus yeah. Uh, it's very uncertain and, and no government had enough data to really be able to plan for you know certainly larger populations like like the uk so very early on we all had to embrace uncertainty as being what we'd have to deal with for a period of time. Until we knew more about the virus, we couldn't actually have any certainty around easing of restrictions, for example. Now we know more about the virus. Now we can say, okay, a face covering would be a good idea, which, you know, two or three months ago, wasn't considered to be something that would be worthwhile. Of course, more data has come through now, which shows that actually it's worth it. If it, if it reduces the risk of contamination, by 50%, that's gonna have a massive impact yeah. for people on public transport in London, for example, or, or any enclosed space. So it's embracing uncertainty on this scale that I, I found really interesting. That's good, that's very, okay. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to go on and, and uh, keep it close to our hearts and move on. Thank you, Funke. We'll come back at that in a minute and open the floor up to some broader questions as well. Um, Tom, we're gonna to change tack a little perhaps um, in terms of, um, talking to you a little bit about, about your, well, tell, Tom, tell, are you, your mic working? Hopefully you're fine. 
Yeah, yeah, should be all right. Tell us a bit about yourself and about um, you know the work you've been doing recently in response in response to the crisis. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been with the National Trust for 10 years now, and I started uh, way back in 2009 leading a contemporary arts program, mm -hmm. um, which isn't the first thing you'd think of, actually, when you think about the National Trust and what it stands for, which is essentially conservation body, looking after um, these amazing places of which have nature, beauty and history. Its motto is nature, beauty, history for everyone forever. So that's kind of what it does. Um, but then I, kind of, after five years of that, I said, why as that body do we only do contemporary art as a national program? Why do we not talk about history? Why do we, what are we, what are we doing by not looking, looking at these things? And it, that was about 2014, recognizing the First World War anniversary was around. Yeah. And then sort of looking ahead from that, we can see that in 2017, we had um, the 50th anniversary of decriminalization of homosexuality. 2018, the 100 years of women first gaining the vote. Um, so we began to develop these these programmes. And the, the following year was a Peterloo massacre from 250 years ago, sort of social protests, people coming together, that kind of thing. And we started various bits of research to look into, do we have links to these things? And the actual surface response from the organisation was, well, say for the women's suffrage anniversary, we, we don't have any Pankhursts, so we haven't got any big anniversaries, so it's all a bit minor. But actually, we went and spoke to historians and they said, well, actually, there's over 100 places where you've got women who uh, organised and created organisations and held rallies. And this is across the landscape of England, Wales, Northern Ireland. We've also got uh, someone like Lord Curzon, who is president of the Anti-Women's Suffrage League as well. So you do see the sort of warp and weft of social history ripped through all this great portfolio of places. So through these programmes, we began to sort of realize that we weren't digging as deep as perhaps we ought to into well, histories and you you've been occasionally dragged onto the front pages of the newspapers right with this so that's because, right yes i guess you'd say it's high impact tell us about the 2017 experience you had. so that was in 2017 so that we did a program called prejudice and pride which was looking at that anniversary of um the decriminalization of male homosexuality in england it's important to be specific about that point i think and the, uh, we worked out that we had about 25 or so places that did have strong links to that, but actually stretched back into the 18th century in some cases, some of the 19th century, some right up to just before that decriminalization act happened. And there was one site that got us onto the front page of the Daily Mail with um, the headline of Fury as National Trust Volunteers Forced to Wear Gay Pride Badges. <laughs> and as with all good front page headlines, there's elements of truth in that, but there's also elements of distortion. And it wasn't um, a forcing of any point. A request had been made, but it hadn't gone down well with some individuals. Therefore, the story had broken. And of course, that immediately then led to a, a deep excavation of everything we were doing on that. And, and um, it, that was a, a traumatic time for some of us, but actually ultimately has improved the organisation, has changed the organisation. We now have a a staff LGBT group that we didn't have before. We regularly attend Pride every year. Um, we have staff joining the organisation because they see that it's an organisation that stands up for its values. So there has been progressive benefit, I would say, yeah, from that. So I guess I'm, I'm really, I really want to talk to you about the initiatives that you're currently you know, leading. Yes. Now, but I do, I also, I just, I'm itching to ask you about whether it's, what you think about the pulling down of statues, because it's sort of a big, you know, it's a big discussion point in the US and in the UK and probably else, I think in France as well, potentially. Um, yeah. Um, that? And so I think it comes back to a point you made earlier about assumptions being busted. I never thought I would see mobs in this country tearing down statues. Yeah. Um, but also the nuance of that in Bristol uh, of uh, predominantly white protesters doing the actual removing. And the scene it reminded me of, from my own experience, was that scene from the Iraq war where the Saddam Hussein statue was pulled yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a deep echo for me in that sort of media media moment. Yeah. Um, it also stimulated a wider debate. So, you know, in a way, history takes care of itself because if people are going to tear down statues, they're going to tear down statues. And all the statues we've seen, or many of the statues, I'd say, from the classical empires have been torn down in their pasts as well. So um, there are things, collapses, a natural part of culture and um, it was what happens to societies. I studied archaeology first, so... Sometimes I take quite a long view on things. Um, so we've actually taken one statue off display from a place in the north. This has been in the news already. Um, there was a figure of a, um, a black male figure holding up a, uh, a sundial 
Uh, it wasn't an enslaved person figure, we think. It was intended as a representation of Africa, but it's definitely an object to be looked at by, uh, in a supplicant position by a, a sort of white aristocratic uh, owner. Yeah. So there was a particular threat was made against it. You know, people said, we're going to take that and chuck it in the canal if they don't remove it. So it was credible enough that we decided to remove it. And we are working through a number of other situations where we're adding interpretation, um, adding uh, his, the history and context, basically, to give people a better idea of, of why they're there and starting a consultation process around them. So that's right. So that's interesting. So the way the National Trust and, and you are reacting to this crisis is, is by putting context around what's there and drawing attention to it and opening it up. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And we, 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 we've actually had a lot. It's easy to say this. We genuinely had long term plans that had just been funded at the end of last financial year that were about to begin. Um, and COVID kind of has just made that budget evaporate. We, you know, we, we, we have to make an income stream. This is all on our annual reports of about between 500 million, and 600 million pounds a year. And we've already had, we estimate 200 million pound losses, I think, so far this year. So we are an organisation in crisis would be a wrong way to characterise it, but we are adapting quickly to this environment. But yet this work needs doing. It's a core part of our mission. Our current director general has spoken publicly. She was on the Today programme last week, um, a big radio show in the UK. Some people may have heard that. We've had articles, Guardian, Mirror, Sunday Times, I think, in the last week, all on this topic. Um, and genuinely, we've had research in the pipeline. There's actually three PhDs underway at the moment. There's about half a dozen or so university partnerships explicitly researching links between colonialism, slavery and our places, aspects of that. But what we hadn't done was got to the stage of realising that research into stuff that we can share publicly and openly very quickly. So we're having to do that at speed now. And that's so I've, I've just come back from furlough of two months. Um, sitting at home doing what fellow people do which is wonder about existence and <laughs> try and keep on top trying and stay sane and make ends meet and work out how you get bread and stuff like that so um, it's coming back into an organization that's working at pace and, and just one final thing about the adaptation of the organization it's essentially it provides access to sites to f the physicality the landscapes the places the collections from the past and if you wipe off access to that why would you support our organization? So we're, members have been continuing to be very generous to support us, but there's this thing about actually in a virtual world, how do you give that, that sort of um, fulfillment to people that they want to support this and they want to see their spaces and these beaches and landscapes and these collections, but also ask difficult questions uh, around um, histories that should be told, but perhaps are not well are, are not being told in certain places as well. Yeah, so that, I was going to ask you. We, you know, we did reference and we spoke on the phone, but um, or spoke previously. I guess the core audience. Hit, I mean, this is probably unfair and unkind, but the core audience could be characterised or you know, stereotyped as kind of white middle class conservative old older people, basically. In, in some sense, is there? Do you think there's going to be a pushback, or do you think that they're? Or do you think do you think they're now also like the rest of us kind of having their minds broadened and opened right now what, what do you think will happen yeah it's, it's one that we we're watching closely but it's also one that we are clear as an organization what our values are you know we are constituted by parliament for the entire uk to benefit from so we can't pick and choose mm -hmm. uh, and yes it might be that at the moment our membership product is more appealing to some than others but actually we do know from the, our most uh, diverse region in terms of um, ethnic diversity is definitely the Midlands um, and they have done a huge amount of work so we are supporting other people to do work like Mosley Road Baths for example which is a sort of derelict swimming pool uh, in Birmingham but actually we know that as a conservation organisation uh, we can help that survive uh, and it, the community it serves is extremely mixed with, with many different um, um, uh, parts of the community gaining benefit from that today and so we're finding ways to um, in, uh, kind of help those kinds of projects happen but I think the shift that's come with the toppling of that statue the acceleration of the work I'm doing now is really actually um, a point that we spoke about that sort of that the what you might call minority histories or the histories of yeah. marginalized communities is actually everybody's history and if you don't attend to that you get this um, dissonance in society and so that lots of the thing I'm hearing a lot about at the moment is people not knowing bits of their own history. Like, did you know that under Queen Victoria there was a raid into Ethiopia? The treasury is divided between 
Um, and when I say treasure, I mean sort of key artifacts of Ethiopia is divided through a number of key cultural agencies, the BNA, British Museum, um, National Trust has part of it. Uh, and also the regime at that time, they kidnapped the emperor's son and he was raised on the Isle of Wight. You know, that's a bit of our history I was never taught. Yeah. And there's, we're not taught those contexts of the colonialist um, uh, mission that the, uh, our, our country has had, and it's not really acknowledged. And so the great work that people like UCL in London, uh, university there, have been looking at the compensation payments of slavery and tracking where does that money go. So when th there's a national narrative that Britain likes to say, well, yeah, we, we got slavery abolished, but actually shortly thereafter, there was a huge compensation payments to the owners of slaves, not to the enslaved people themselves, but to the owners, and those were still being paid off till 2015. So those of us who are working people up to 2015, our taxes have helped pay off that. I think that, so, yeah, I remember hearing kind of those articles on the radio in the last couple of weeks and found it really rather incredible, actually. And, and yeah. you know, we hadn't been exposed to that information. Are you seeing like a general response across the arts and cultural sector? I mean, it's not just you guys and the National Trust. Are you seeing, are you seeing anything interesting elsewhere that's giving you hope and inspiring you? Yeah, I think there's, I think it's that, the thing I would focus on at the moment is that transition of a, a ally to accomplice, which is language that some people may be hearing more of. So the, the term ally, as in you're supportive generally of the of progressive agendas, you know, you want equitable action and equality to happen, but actually what are you doing? What is the action you are taking? So I've never had more conversations with white people, my friends and my family, about racial equality than I have in the last couple of months. And I think there's something around the mass experience of everybody being in this, to some degree, shared experience, even though our encounters with our experience do vary wildly. We are thinking about all this stuff and seeing it um, uh, kind of coming into our media feeds all the time and working out what that means. So essentially, what action are you going to take? And I've also seen this idea about uh, sort of what you people turning abolition and actually defunding disinvesting even if it's attention so actually if if an organization has essentially could be judged to be a white supremacist organization and it's not worth the attention it can't it's unreformable so i think there's something around people like myself in the positions i'm in just doing the work that we absolutely know needs to be done mm -hmm. and also wanting to work in partnership with others um, from people of colour, black led organisations and, and looking at what that needs but also paying attention to people who just go you know what you had your chance it's gone way beyond that yeah. so that's a particular thing that has arisen in the last couple of months it'll be interesting to see where that goes I think. But yeah so that, maybe we could sort of come to close on this section of our conversation really with a, a question around how, how do you hope that this crisis won't be wasted I can see, you know, clearly you've got strong opinions and, and a strong set of values yourself. And I'm sure that's why you're drawn to the National Trust and, and its leadership. But how do you hope this crisis won't be wasted? I think it's really making changes to mainstream activities. Actually, it comes back to some of the things that Funko was alluding to about healthcare, you know, such a prime service. But if you can see changes happening to that in such a short space of time, what might we do for mainstream things like school education around yeah. empire, imperialism, the, the, the sort of a, a more a, a fuller history, a full history of, of, of what went before. And I think there is this thing about changing the mainstream is an important thing. Even if that's in, in my particular world, the, the landing page for any place, you know, nice day out kind of inquiry yeah. to a castle or a house, but actually you foreground the fact that the money came from X, Y, and Z. And whereas that might have been, oh, that's a bit uncomfortable, let's bury that in the footnote. It's, it's worth considering how you for, what you foreground, what you pay attention to, I think, is what you act on. So that would be my thing about um, don't waste this crisis, pay attention to the right things to make them change. I think that's fascinating. And um, um, I'm getting some nice questions bound, bounced around in the chat, and, uh, uh, which I'll bring some up later on, I think, as we get, as we get into it. But I, one question for you, Tom, I guess is, is, and I guess maybe to end this section is, you know, what would you... What would you like people like us to do? This is a question from Sarah in our group. Actually, she's writing to me privately on the side. But um, what um, what would you think we should do? What could we do to help? It's I guess from the context of the you know, national trust and that sort of culture, rather than more broadly. So when you say we, who do you mean by we? Um, 
people on this call or people that okay. we take. I think it's that thing of really look at your own life, your own practice, um, practice by like how you live, what choices you make, mm -hmm. um, and and being very attentive and thoughtful about that. Um, I think there is something about sitting with the discomfort. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, that means you're probably learning. It's that old thing as if you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and so what are you learning? And pay attention to that and start asking questions, calling yeah. stuff out, calling it into the conversation so you can act on it. That's very interesting. You'll be amused. To hear. I had a, I do, I get coached about once a month, and that was that was the theme today in the coaching call was to sit in your daily practice, spend more time thinking and reacting, and feel when you feel disturbance, let's sit with it and work out why. So that's kind of weird, yeah. strange synchrony. But um, <laughs> thank you, Tom. Well, we'll come back at the end. I mean, lots. Of, I know we're going to get a lot of questions. Um, but I think one of the things that I drew, I drew out from speaking to you that got me quite excited, Tom, was um, a sense of a kind of opening you know, an opening up that's happening, a creation of opportunity that perhaps might not have been there in a world that seemed quite fixed and locked perhaps in the past. And maybe that's a good segue, Ruth, onto to us having a conversation. And we had a, we had a chap on a few months ago, I guess, who was a politics professor from the University of Oxford, who talked about how, and it's really stuck with me, this thought, how the crisis has, what he said, has, this is quite academic, I think, but had opened up conceptual space. In other words, there was suddenly room for manoeuvre that hadn't been there before. Um, and that's an amazing opportunity not to be wasted, which I guess is part of the genesis for this, this talk. Ruth, how are you? Doing okay. Oh, it's Thank been you for hanging on. <laughs> how are you feeling? Are you um, able to tell us a little bit about, um, I've, I've given a bit of a sense of your background, but tell us you're working on a really fascinating and important project at the moment. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I will. Um, and I will in a sec, but I was going to say something about yeah, please, please. Um, kind of my just because it's sort of I've been thinking about I've done a, a range of different things over time, and it will get back to your this will get back to your question. I've done a range of different things over time. I've um, I've worked for a think tank where we tried to introduce ideas into the world in a way that um, hopefully broke into the public consciousness in some way. And I'm thinking I've been thinking about what links all of the different things that I've done. And I think what I've been interested in over time is what happens when you interrupt something in some way, when you interrupt a process, when you interrupt a conversation and create a disturbance that opens up a space in which people can think differently. So when I worked at the think tank, a place called the New Economics Foundation, we did things like launch something we called the Happy Planet Index which was an index of the relative, um, uh, the relative efficiency, ecological efficiency, with which different countries delivered long and happy lives to the people who lived there. And that turned the way that you think about the world upside down. So the UK came that we think of as a developed nation, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of questions in that in terms of how we got there in the first place in our colonial legacy. But where we think of the UK as developed, actually a country like Costa Rica, where people live very long and happy lives, but without a huge strain on the Earth's resources, came out top. Um, I'm also an artist and activist. I've worked with the, um, the artist activist group Liberate Tate. We made unsanctioned performances in Tate Gallery, which Tate Gallery is a, a large art gallery in the UK. And we made unsanctioned performances to bring into question the gallery's relationship with the oil company BP. Brilliant. So, stuff. Yeah, I'm really impressed. Yeah, so through, through all of that stuff, it's about um, how do you, I mean, we were trying to create interruptions and now here we are at a point where we've got a collective, a collective global interruption. So I um, work for a group called the Green New Deal Group. Um, they first came together in 2008 in response to the global financial crisis yeah. and proposed a way through that that drew on the legacy of President Roosevelt's introduction of the New Deal in the US in response to the, um, in response to the Great Depression there. And that's where basically um, in a depression with the economy tanking, government spent into the economy in a way to... Um, in a way to generate activity, but and not just to generate jobs and generate activity. And I guess this is interesting in terms of what um, Tom's been speaking about. The 
So when Roosevelt initiated the New Deal, he created jobs, he created jobs um, across the economy that got people working, got people paying their taxes, but he also put artists into every school. Um, he put musicians into schools. He funded the painting of murals. So he was interested not just in economic recovery, but also in the cultural health of the nation. Um, so I've been, um, I've been working for this group. I'm based in the office of a, a Green MP in the UK. Um, she's our only, only Green MP. And we had been working on a proposal where we were going to go around the country looking for examples of um, local authorities and, and local community groups who were, um, who were responding to the climate crisis and delivering change. Mm. And then COVID comes along. Um, so what we, what we came up with was a proposal for a project that would try and make use of this, this moment, this collective moment that I think we all are experiencing differently, but there's a degree of connection. Yeah. So our experience of COVID will vary depending on whether we've, you know, whether we've, whether we've been locked down in a house or a garden or a tiny, or a tiny flat with no outside space. Our experience is different, but it's collective. And I think what that does that's interesting is kind of gives us an insight into other people's lives that we, we wouldn't normally have. I mean, Tom said, um, Tom said minority history is everyone's history, which kind of struck me. But I think also what COVID has taught us in some ways is that minorities every day is everyone's every day or at least it should be and we should be thinking about um why we still live in quite such an unequal society so um we came up with a proposal that we're calling reset um and the idea is that we don't want to do politics in the way that people normally do politics which is where we um reach out to a bunch of um sort of think tanks and charities or are lobbied by businesses um, and then come up with some policy proposals which which government may may or may not implement but we wanted to use the opportunity of this this kind of collective moment to have a conversation with people about what their experience has been um, what they've learned and the way that the way that people want to um, rebuild life in in the UK um, so that life is better. So we want to we want to bring politicians in contact with into direct conversation with people and work these things through together. Because I think, as as Funke has, has touched on, we've seen some extraordinary innovation, and not just from businesses at the local community level. Um, we've seen six form colleges um, uh, sort of three D printing face masks for people in supermarkets. So there's a there's huge amount of potential and knowledge and experience and innovation that um, that is kind of sort of lying dormant across the country and we want to tap into that and work out a plan to build back better together. Is that one of the things I was going to ask you is why the idea of a conversation is so important in politics as opposed to or in terms of making a new world emerge and I guess it's because if you're not asking well I shouldn't be answering that why is the conversation such an important? Um, um, because I think politics has become something, become something that is done to people very largely. Yeah. And unless politics becomes something that we do together, unless we take, we take um, decisions together or we, we work together on solutions to the multiple crises that we, we face, or the crises that we face in greater and, and um, smaller degrees all the time, unless unless we work together, conversations are ways into working together. So the question is, how do we work together better to make life better for everyone in the UK? Yeah, so I love, I mean, I love the idea of interruption and I think lots of people in the chat are also buzzing on that thought, which is you know, quite a powerful way of thinking about it. And I, I'm inspired by the idea that there is dormant and latent brilliance in all our countries and societies and organizations probably that isn't finding its voice effectively and that, if you could kind of engage those guys, that would be good. I'm, slight, I'm slightly anxious about, there's a sort of cl classic phrase, isn't there, that um, a horse, no, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Like how, and often consensus-based things can be a bit blah, a bit 
lowest common denominator. How do you manage to maintain like a radical agenda when you're sort of importing lots of different people's perspectives? Well, I think, um, I mean, I think we, we, we're also making sure that we're, we're working with a diverse range of people, which doesn't, we, but I think, you know, I think the thing is that, that um, you trust people, you find a way in that begins with people's lived experience, um, that we're not, we're not looking for absolute consensus, but we're looking for where, where the synergies lie, I suppose. Um, and I think, you know, I think one of the, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things that's come through people's experience of COVID is sort of where, where synergies are emerging. And there's some really, we're seeing some really interesting shifts in the way that people see themselves and other people. Mm. So, for example, you Gav do kind of quite, do regular polling um, and they polled people in the UK back in February and they ask a sort of pretty standard question um, um, which is sort of whether whether you see the UK as somewhere where we look out for ourselves or somewhere where we look out for one another and in February 70% of people would have said it's a place where we look out for ourselves and by April that had totally flipped and 70% of people said that they think the UK is a place where we look out for one another. Yeah. Now, maybe that won't last, and maybe it's not permanent, and maybe it was a response to a particular experience, but it's still something that was a response to people, something that people experienced together. I think, you know, a whole range of the things that we've seen from, you know, from his um, sort of talk, talk, was talking about how people in the health se care sector have been collaborating. Um, Tom was talking about has been you know talking about how people and organisations are having quite a, a a sort of a fundamental questioning of what their roles and responsibilities are in response to Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and those things are experiences that create relationships that I think stick. I think I think there is a degree by which some of those things they might fade a little, but they won't be forgotten. Um, yeah what we're interested in doing with reset is is you know is making sure you know there's that thing that the saying sort of never let a good crisis go to waste but um and that's what this is all about but but it's making sure that we capture the learning from that and we're not looking for we're not looking for consensus we're not looking for uniformity but we're looking for the places where we we can come together and yeah. things that people agree on and want to want to make happen so you, one thing you said to, to me, and I, I've got this sense from our conversation now, is about how much this is about a, you know, a really smart, inclusive process rather than having a predetermined you know, end game in mind. But there, but there must be still, between you and Caroline and others, like a sort of a vision of what the future, a future, a future possible might be. Could you paint that for us, at least give us a bit of hope for a brief moment about where we might be headed? Um, well, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of a future possible, I think it's sort of, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of building from from some of the unintended benefits of, of lockdown and questions about, well, how can we, how might we make those more long term, like quieter streets, less pollution, more connected neighbourhoods, um, more flexible working patterns, respect for key workers. So it's sort of when, um, when we start to get into those things, um, a, a life where we maybe pay a bit more attention to where our food comes from and how it's produced and who produces it and how they're paid. Yeah. So I think there are kind of there are a whole range of ways in which just by building out from that experience we can begin to see sort of the you know the, the sort of the hidden architecture of what a slightly different future might look like and I think we've all experienced it to a greater and, and lesser ex extent. That's a really interesting of a sort of, well, I find the idea of a hidden architecture that's sort of beneath the surface but emergent is quite fascinating actually. And do you, do you think that the elites in governments, I guess you're closest to the UK experience, but maybe this thing this applies more broadly around the sort of developed world or anywhere in the world, but is, do you think that the general motivation and mood is one of, is more akin to where you're going? Or do you think it's still going to, is there still a big resistance, a big ignorance, a big desire not to engage with the climate crisis and the climate shock that's coming? I guess it, it, it's, it's always yes and. I think, I mean, I think 
not talking about the kind of the political arena quite so directly, but but what has been so inspiring for me in building, bringing the team together who are making Reset possible is how many people who've been excited have been excited about the project. And we are bunch, working with a, a bunch of amazing people who are giving up their time for free to make it happen. And that's been really exciting and gives me hope. In terms of kind of the wider political realm, um, in France, a, a bunch of parliamentarians um, ran a project called um, Le Jour d'Après, sort of the, the day after, which was a very similar initiative where they were trying to kind of work with people um, to look at the kind of different future we might bring, build. Um, we can look to um, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern and what she's been actually doing in practice rather than just talking about it. Um, I know that we're... we're going to speak with a group in Australia who are interested in running the same process so so I think there are more people who are interested in having the conversation and working together and um, to make change happen of course there are people pushing back the other way there always will be it's never going to be change is always a dynamic process and there are always not always but but there are people who want to make, make change happen and people who want to resist it and the question is how do we creatively, dynamically intervene into emerging circumstances in ways that, that, that create permission for people to have a conversation and imagine that things might be different? Um, and I think in terms of, of like whether and how change happens, um, the writer and activist uh, Rebecca Solnit says, um, anything could happen and whether we act or not has everything to do with it. And I think, you know, I think that's the, that's the key thing. It's like, well, how do we given this moment, what do we do with it? And that's a question for all of us. Anything could happen and whether or not, and whether we act on it is everything to do with it. So you said, yeah. to make sure I get that down. I really like that. Hopefully someone wrote that down for me because I'll, I'll, um, I'm gonna use that. So to, can you help us think, as this is the last question really for, for you and then we'll get to the group as a whole, but how, what would you hope that we could do, we on this call maybe, but you know, people that you reach out to, so as not to waste this amazing moment of interruption and, and reset? Well, um, you could take part in the reset process, which launches on Saturday. Um, with the web, web address is reset-uk.org. So take part, everyone's welcome, and we want to hear from as many people as possible. In general, I think um, in terms of um, what we do with this moment, I think um, don't ever believe anyone who tells you that something is impossible because it's just not realistic because a whole range of things we've seen um, are realistic and I think experiment collaborate um, work with as many different people as possible I love it that's really brilliant thank you Ruth for that it was a really interesting and clear-eyed view of um something which I think we all feel sort of a bit sometimes hopeless but also quite hopeful about so um, so what I'm going to do now is ask anyone who wants to as if they can't get into the website I know we'll come back to that later and if I'll do a follow-up mail tomorrow and also by the way we have launched a new space on discord which will be mailing to you at 7 p.m um a new space where we can carry on these conversations after the event so look out for that um Guys, what questions do you have for um, each of or any of our speakers tonight? Um, if, if you could put a question on the side or your theme on the side, and then we'll get, ideally, if you're up for it, we'll get you on screen and get you to ask it, because it's always fun to do that. <laughs> I'm reading the chat. Someone give me a question. Or maybe you can ask each other a question. <laughs> I'm surprised people haven't got something they want to ask today. I think one thing might be, I suppose, oh, is there a question there from Sarah? No. The chat's happening in the side chat today, more than on our, on our call. So between Tom and Funke and Ruth, what, what did you find um, interesting in some of the conversations that you heard today? Were there any, any particular themes that really, you know, particularly struck a chord with you, Tom or Funke or Ruth even? I'm I'm happy to kind of leap in and have, have a have a go. I think something that it strikes me is this rupture. Like the, there has just been this experience of so much just being cut across, 
and so then people have to give attention to designing that encounters again so how do you encounter a health service or a climate change movement or in my case the kind of heritage experience and so there's that real consciousness about having to act um i think funky you're talking about you know how you shower how you get in a building you know that real attention to detail that i think none of us uh, before this or, or not very often do you have to do that to that degree so uh, and keep revisiting that and i think there's a bit of a learning there for me actually about that i think Okay, what about you? Did anything particularly sort of strike you? Yeah, for me, actually, what's, what's really come out of this is um, the concept of bias uh, being challenged um, beyond diversity and inclusion, which is where I originally uh, thought of bias affecting outcomes, mm -hmm. but actually challenging your way of thinking within uh, looking at what's possible, what's impossible. We all have our biases. I mean, there's a, you know, one of my colleagues at Roche, uh, Kristen Presner, um, has done a TED, TEDx talk on uh, biases, admitting she's biased and this is how she overcame it. And um, it's called flip it to test it, this, uh, this mechanism. And you just basically flip it around. Would you make that assumption if uh, that was a, a white man as opposed to a black man, for example? But what I now realize is that that can apply to anything that we make an assumption about. And I think we can actually take that forward now and think, what this has really taught us is that we need to challenge our own biases in, in all sorts of ways, not, not just within diversity and inclusion, but just b more broadly, how we live our lives, how we assume others live their lives, how we run our businesses. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really, and that's really only just sort of, I think over the last few weeks, it's come together that uh, that flip it to test it, um, you know, mechanism can actually be of much broader. That was very cool. Maybe if you could find the URL, we can share it either in the yes, Discord yes. or email. Yes, yes. Delighted to. Yeah. I'd love to watch that as well. There's a question from Fern that I liked. And Fern, whether you would um, consider coming on screen and asking it. Yeah, hello. 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 That was as brilliant as I thought it would be. Um, I'm interested in... All of you are quite impassioned by the change that's been happening and uh, it's all close to your hearts. And I guess... Um, what do you do to avoid being seen as being optimistic, opportunistic in using a crisis to get the things that you want to happen to happen? That's it. <laughs> Any of you can go for that one. It, it's a very good question. And, um, you know, I, I'm deeply conscious of, you know, <laughs> Earlier this week, redundancy notices went out to my colleagues. I know people who've lost loved ones, volunteers for the National Trust won't be coming back again because they sadly died of COVID. Um, so in terms of not being seen to be opportunistic, I think there is a, uh, a degree of just honesty and openness about we have to reinvent so much anyway. Why would we reinvent a bad thing? it's so you want to make it the best it can be recognizing the context that you're in and i think there's something around the humanity that you need to bring to that process of um of redesign and remaking um and a, a particular uh, organization i'd like to give a shout out for that's really impressed me is the um civic square in birmingham it's a sort of neighborhood impact hub um and they just ran an amazing five-day conference called re so thinking about Ruth and, and Reset. So they, they've just run an amazing conference and they're about to put it all live. So I'll share that with Discord when it goes up. Um, but that was something that really impressed me. Yeah. Anyone else want to take a take on the challenge of thinking about how not to look like you're being opportunistic about seizing this moment? Yes, um, I guess just in a, a quite a fundamental level, sort of, it's sort of something to do with what Tom said about the importance of paying attention. Um, is that I think if you begin by paying attention, then you're not you're not sort of rushing into a space with preconceived ideas. And and one of the big things that I think is important about reset is that we're starting from people's experience and we're building the project out from there. So we're not we are that there are some there are some frames that we're setting around, and it, and I think it links again to what Tom said about you know about well, if we've got this, if we need to reconfigure anyway, why don't we do it in a way that's better? So, so that's a kind of, that's, a, that's an assumption that we're starting from, that if we're going to do it, we, we may as well do it better. But then we begin with, 
in with paying attention to where people are and what they say they want. What about you, Funke? Yeah, I, I see this in, in the context of, um, ironically, Black Lives Matter and White Allies, because I've, I've seen, this is something you refer to, Tom, actually, far more active listening. Um, I had several of my white allies contact me in the last few weeks, not only saying, are you okay, which was wonderful, because they're all very good friends of mine. It was a genuine concern for my well-being. But actually, with some of them, this is what I'm already doing to deal with the issue. I've already read the book about white fragility. I'm looking at this, and in one example, exceptional leader had already put in place certain action plans and had already had meetings with various individuals to make certain things happen to improve the odds uh, for, for, for young black people in that organization. So there's been a definite shift there, and I think that gave me real hope there's a real acknowledgement that inequalities do exist now because until now the evidence wasn't so in our face. So it was very easy and convenient because it's uncomfortable <laughs> to, to try it. and ignore it. But now there's overwhelming evidence um, globally, you know, that, that it does exist. And I think that is what has ignited this, this movement we're seeing, this global movement. I'm inspired by that really. Do you, I mean, one thing that as a question that I'm going to, um, I'll paraphrase it from Argiri Papathos, if you don't mind, but you know, you guys all, all represent a very progressive worldview, I think, and all, we're all the luckier for having had a chance to listen to that and, and discuss it today. What sort of, do you think the kind of leaders that are emerging now or will come next will be different as a result of how they, you know, what's been happening in the last couple of months? Do you think there's a, a new kind of leadership style that's going to emerge? I hope so. I hope so. I, you know, we, we've looked at, there are lots of comparisons drawn between um, New Zealand and how they dealt with, with this whole pandemic and the UK, frankly, you know, and uh, even stripping aside the fact it's a smaller population and all those sorts of things. Essentially, the way that New Zealand's dealt with this is based on compassion and kindness. Mm. And that's the leadership style that we see with Jacinda Ardern. So, I would hope that that will happen, you know, that, that leaders across the world will realize that being kind and having empathy is crucial to building trust and, and getting people on board. It's a massive piece of influencing and, and moving towards a common goal. If people feel they can trust you, you care about them, they'll, they'll have your back. You know, they'll feel you're putting skin in the game as a leader. And I get that sense with Jacinda Ardern. I really genuinely feel she has put skin in the game as, a, as an individual. And that's where this compassion and kindness comes from. That's why she's so effective. So I'm very hopeful. Uh, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but uh, it's a very visible case study, if you like, of, of the impact of that style of leadership. So I'm very hopeful. Oh, very, that's very uplifting. What about um, Ruth and Tom, maybe final words? I'm conscious that it's after seven and probably there are children to be put to bed and drinks to be had and emails to be turned off but um how about you in from a leadership point of view so i think i'm the, the, some of the leaders i'm seeing emerging are at the point where particularly the culture sector which for a long time has had a language and a, a way of if you like co-opting the the problems of diversity into doing just enough to get the funding i'm going to be blunt there um and I think there's people who've just had enough. You know, I've, I've heard people say they've had enough. So they are turning their back on that and reinventing things in their own way. And there's something about not wanting to set up competitive structures on the old model, but find a new way forward and be curious about what that could be. So actually community organizations owning their assets, assets like land and buildings and actually having that stake in that thing locally. And, and I think there's a, a new localism feels like it could be emerging to me, which feels very exciting. That's it, that is fascinating. How about you, Ruth? Um, I think, I mean, I think what's interesting and, and sort of in some ways sort of, um, drawn from what both um, Funke and Tom have said, I think what's interesting is that the more that we see these kind of examples of different forms of leadership, the more it empowers all of us to kind of, and, it, and it's sort of a move towards a place where we kind of see leadership being modelled differently and we don't wait for others to lead. We also kind of take on leadership roles ourselves in our own lives and our own communities. 
Um, so I think, you know, I think what um, gives me hope is the potential for that kind of leadership to become contagious. I love it. I better live up to it. I mean, all better. <laughs> we can all try and live up to it after tonight. Thank, um, guys, thank you so much for giving up your time on a, a hot Wednesday evening in London, um, for giving us a very honest and open and personal um, response to both this crisis, the, uh, the crisis of COVID and the crisis of Black Lives Matter. And, and I think to see the opportunity and I feel, I feel more hopeful afterwards than I did at the beginning, which I think is not a bad way of spending an hour because I think we need, we need that at the moment. So um, a, ma a massive thanks from me. And I think a massive thanks usually from all the guys who are um, watching the recording and listening in. Um, we'll be back in two weeks time. We're thinking of doing something on um, unlocking human potential. Um, which is an interesting topic, I think. We've got the new group open on Discord, so do join in, and that's a space where you can engage with us and each other and race themes, and, and we'd l love to see if, if that works as an experiment, but let's give it a try. And this is recorded and on YouTube. If you search it, you can find it, and I think the link's in the chat. So you can always go back to um, tonight's conversation and pick up some of the quotes and, and, and anything like that. Uh, or indeed watch any of the other events that we've had. So I think um, at that point, I'll say good night and I'll say thank you very much to everyone involved, to Ruth, to Tom, to Funke and to Nick for looking after the technology behind the scenes so nicely and for your questions and for your attention. Thank you guys. It's always great fun to see you all. I love you all. See you soon. Bye.